Greetings. My apologies for the less than optimal audio quality here. I did a firmware update and now my external microphone won't work. So uh, I will get that figured out soon. Now, I know a lot of you are feverishly waiting for the next part of the Ender series, but there are a few things I had to take care of that I really wish I'd taken care of some of these things ahead of time, but I thought, uh, let me just get it started and then I'll sort of push these out as it goes along. Well, as it ends up, I should have done them ahead of time, but I digress. So I figured what I would do was, instead of putting out no videos all, and by the way, sorry I didn't get a video out last week, I my allergies were so bad I actually thought I had to flu for two days. That's how bad they were. But my voice was all messed up and I couldn't record. Sorry about that. So I figured, hey, why don't I put out a couple short videos about preparations that are being made for things and then maybe we'll learn some stuff along the way. And that's where my voice gave out again. So you're not going to see any more of my beautiful face in this. So feel free to screenshot this and stick it over there. So while you're watching this video, you can stare deeply and meaningfully into my eyes. But if I do voiceovers like this, I can walk away when my voice gives out and then just come back and keep going. Also, as you may or may not know, this channel is supported primarily by Patreon subscriptions. So what I'm doing with these videos is the first pass edits that have a little bit more like personal stuff and ranting and tangents and things like that. That's going to be exclusive to uh, Patreon supporters, whereas the edited version is going to be available for all of you ad supported on YouTube. So it's not locking up videos behind a paywall. I don't like doing that. But if you're really interested in just, you know, kind of like my unique perspectives and additional rants, then that's just an added bonus for a subscription. So what's the subject du jour, I hear you ask? Well, technically, I guess it started with making a really crummy signal generator out of a little blue pill board. But that soon ballooned into also working with oscilloscopes and logic analyzers and some lessons in C++, dealing with the Arduino IDE and complaining about fake chips. I almost said a curse word there. And this all does ultimately have to do with the Ender series, but you'll see. So come along with me on my journey through tangents and rabbit holes, and maybe we'll learn something along the way. Now, this is going to get supremely nerdy in some places, and I know there's going to be people all along the way that just want to scream at me in the comments because of the way I'm doing things. I'll try my best to explain why it is I'm doing what I is as it goes along and try to keep it fun. So essentially I'm doing this for three reasons. One is just to make a fast square wave generator out of stuff I had lying around. A second is to test and benchmark the actual STM32 chip. And the third is just for mental exercises and learning and conveying some data to all of you. But Alex, I hear you say, you're just gonna be toggling pins to make a square wave generator? That's not the right way to do it. Yes, relax, I know, but if I did it the right way, I wouldn't have an example for this video. We're just gonna bit bang a square wave and deal with it. And part of that has to do with the way that I view the gear I use in these videos. I like to keep it cheap and open, not only because I'm not independently wealthy, but also because I like people to be able to do this stuff at home if they want and give them examples of how to do that. So we will be using the cheapest hand tech USB oscilloscope on the market, along with open hand tech 6022 for the, the firmware and the UI. Now, these scopes are very limited and they do have their inherent problems. Uh, I won't get to that in this video because it'll take too long to explain, but I will get to that in a further oscilloscope video. I'll put an affiliate link to these down in the video description in case you see one and you're like, oh my God, where was it my whole life? But just bear in mind that they are fairly limited. Those scopes are additionally supported by uh, PulseView in SIGROC. So we're definitely going to be using PulseView for a little bit where our oscilloscope software kind of falls short. And then where the specs of the actual hardware fall short and fall short, they will because they are, to put it mildly modest, we're going to pull out some old boat anchors. This scope right here, which is still an 80 scope, but it's 100 megahertz and has some bells and whistles that I really like. And you'll notice there the 3D printed shroud with the webcam pointed right at it so that I can get this on the screen and just do a screen capture when I need to show you code and an oscilloscope trace. And then on my second monitor, I can run a logic analyzer. So yeah, this is my life right now. 
And I will in future videos be comparing some of these like uh, cheapy budget portable oscilloscopes that you see popping up these days. I have a couple of these coming. I have a couple of them here because even the crappiest of what a uh, engineer would call a toy scope has its uses. It's a, not a toy if you use it as a tool. And I will grab some kind of desktop DSO, but they usually have fairly crappy specs on the low end. So I have to find that just perfect one as far as budget to performance and I'm still rifling through specs. So yes, teaser, non-snobby oscilloscope video coming in the near future, near-ish. And for a software environment, we're just going to be using the Arduino IDE because that's a good way to get beginners into this without blowing their minds with setup and all that stuff. I'll explain a little bit later. So the way we're going to do this is start simple and then build up to utterly ridiculous. And as we get further into it, that should make evident why doing things like this is quote unquote the wrong way to do it. Very basics of our ghetto square waste generator. First thing we have to do is we have our setup and we have our regular loop. Now we have to set the pin mode of the pin we want. Obviously I'm using PB4 and we set that to output. Then we have the main loop right here where we're doing a digital write high. Then we're going to hold that high for a period of time. And then we're going to set it low and hold it low for a period of time. And that's going to draw the wave that we see on the right, the square wave right here. Um, the frequency is going to depend on whatever, however long we hold it for and how long the operations take. And then the scope is there so that after I upload it to the blue pill, it'll show you exactly what the frequency looks like and it'll show us the time base. For example, right here, a delay of one millisecond up and one millisecond down gives us 500 hertz. And we can see that right here on unit juggler. If we just put in two milliseconds, that's one millisecond up, one millisecond down, plus whatever our calls make, that's 500 hertz scar waves that we get out. Approximately 500 squirts. We'll get to that. Now, the fastest we can really get if we want any kind of delay with the standard library, simple as possible, is delay microseconds one. And that is going to equal 206.4 kilohertz. And over to Unit Juggler to confirm that. Hey, wait a minute. Two microseconds should be 500 kilohertz. Why not even half that fast? Enter the Arduino void loop. Notice I didn't say enter the Arduino for loop because the main loop in our Arduino sketches is not a true loop. It is a void function, which is just a C++ function that doesn't return a value. And you can shove any dang thing you want in there. And the Arduino IDE happens to do a bunch of like checks and safety protocols every time you loop. We want to run an infinite loop. So there's another loop that's actually simpler. That's just called a while loop. And what we're going to do here is take this main void loop and hit that beginning as few times as possible. So the main loop is basically just going to run once at the beginning. And then our while loop is going to loop all the stuff that we want to do. So let's run the two against each other and see what we get if we do away with our delay functions altogether. So if we have zero delay and just use our digital write high and our digital write low, then we have about 460 some kilohertz. If we then pop our nested while loop in here and do away with that overhead, send that to the pill, then you can see that our total is now about 650 kilohertz. So we've gained roughly 200 kilohertz in a deal just by doing away with it. But right now, let's get away from microseconds and kilohertz and get off the map a little bit into nanoseconds and megahertz territory. And I say off the map because now we're going to get into microprocessor specific code and stuff that you can't find just by looking up the how to's on like the Arduino website or anything like that. Now, buried deep within our Arduino 15 folder, wherever it is your operating system decided to hide it, we have all kinds of information about our platform, as well as libraries and functions that were put there for convenience by the manufacturers. And what we're going to do is replace our Arduino function with the much less portable code that's specifically made for these ST chips, meaning the LLGPIO set output pin function. And that function just takes the uh, GPIO bank that you're using and the pin that's on that bank. And then we need a much faster delay function. Now we don't really have a nanosecond delay. We could set up a timer or something like that. But again, we're trying to do this simple and stupid to just set up. So we're going to add a little bit of machine code here just to say, look, waste one cycle. Don't do anything for one cycle. Don't do anything for 10 cycles. And that's just called a NOP as in no operation. And the ASM tag, that just means that it's assembler. And then volatile pretty much just tells the compiler to keep its dirty, grubby, optimizing hands off of it. Anyway, we're going to give it 10 knobs up and then 10 knobs down and then see what we get. 
which in our case, we can turn into cycles because we know what our clock of our microprocessor is. It's 72 megahertz. So each of those cycles is going to be 13.8 repeated. So if we go ahead and multiply that by two, one cycle of a, a clock up and a clock down is gonna be 27.7 repeated nanoseconds. Did I say microseconds before? I meant nanoseconds. Which should bring us up to 3.6 megahertz if the world is perfect. However, the world is not perfect. And sometimes you have to go ahead and tune these by hand, which is what I did for some of these little macros right here, which is super ugly and super dirty and super not portable. Meaning that your code is gonna break if you move it to different microprocessors and move it uh, to different IDEs and different compilers. That's the dirty part of quick and dirty. Even on the same chip, I mean, there's nothing that says you can't overclock your 72 megahertz to something else or like across very similar families, like you have differences in caches and pipelinings and flash speed and different amounts and types of SRAM. You also could have like 128 bit flash accelerators with very particular instruction sets that kind of speed up some things and not others. That was a problem I came into or bumped into when I was doing the evaluation of the NXP LPC series processors on the rearm board because they have all kinds of different goofy modes for their cache accelerators or RAM accelerators or flash accelerators or whatever the heck they call it. And to figure all that out, you would have to look at that particular section in the hundreds of pages of documentation for that particular family of chip. So if y'all are wondering why 30-bit development goes so slowly, that's why. Because maybe you didn't read this particular section right here that's very important to getting the timing right. So we're running at 400 some kilohertz, upload this without any of the delays except for like the 10 cycles, 10 cycles, and all of a sudden we're at 2.666 megahertz exponentially faster just by using built-in courtesy functions that are in our library instead of in the Arduino IDE. But let's keep building. We can go faster than that by directly writing to the GPIO registers ourselves, And we're going to do that by applying a bit mask to what's called the BSRR register. The results of this are, if we wanted to write directly to a register, it's super duper not portable unless you make some kind of macro to change that depending on what boards you support. But it's also as fast as it gets using the pin toggle method aside from directly writing the assembler code, which we're not gonna do. So the BSRR stands for bit set reset register, meaning we're going to write directly to the bit on a pin that's going to hold it high and then reset that to set it low again. And that's the register where we can do our like atomic bit wise, you know, shifting and operations, that sort of thing. But basically they've made it so that you can do away with all of the bit wise logic, thankfully, mercifully, and you can get away with just shifting or you don't even have to shift if you don't want to. So what we can do is if we want to toggle something high and toggle something low, we can write to that bit directly and then shift it up 16 because it's, you know, a 16 bit word and that's going to shift it the other way. Or if you want something that's a little bit more human readable, we can just use what's on the bottom and that's what I'm gonna use in the example. Another thing we're gonna do for the ultra high speed stuff is we're going to change the slew rate of our pin from, uh, I think the default is medium, we're gonna change that to high. So essentially we're just trying to represent with our craziness a square wave. So if we have a slow slew rate, it doesn't rise fast enough to make it actually square. That means it's a slow slew. Whereas like fast is going to be much more swear. And slew is just a uh, delta per unit of time. So change per unit of time. When we upload that to our blue pill and we look at the trace on the scope, we can see that we are around like six megahertz here. So yeah, we're moving into pretty fast territory. But now we have mo speed, mo problems. Cause if we shift our signal around a little bit, we can actually see in our waveform where our while loop processing overhead comes in, which is right here. And if we're trying to trigger off of that, our poor little hand tech, which doesn't have a very high sample rate, is going to go absolutely nuts trying to figure out what exactly a frequency we're operating at. So we've essentially come to the limits of what we can do with this device. On to SIGROCK Pulse View. This is more of a logic analyzer than a real-time waveform viewer. So we're not particularly interested in the waveform right now. We've covered all that. We want to move on to acquiring an entire sample buffer full of signals 
and then look at the general trends. We're just gonna grab 5,000 samples and see what our waveform looks like. And then I am using this option right here to trigger the logic via the signal average, and it'll assume a trigger based on the average of the waveform. But if you remember, our oscilloscope was dithering between like nine some megahertz and six something megahertz. We can see right here that it is indeed six megahertz and we can see the overhead from our while loop. So that leads us to the next ugly hack that's going to get me more hate mail. We're going to unroll some loops by hand. Now, this is very basic loop unrolling. It's not even really like unrolling, but I do a lot of this crap when I was trying to optimize DSP algorithms. But let's say we have our for loop, like we described before, and it's going to run through four times. So each time it's going to say, it's going to increment the letters A, B, C, D. So we would loop A, loop B, loop C, and loop D. Now, what if we had one loop and instead of iterating through four times, we just said A, B, C, D each in one loop? Well, we can go ahead and do that by copy pasting our entire little algorithm here, our entire waveform, essentially unrolling the loop as many times as we copy paste, and then we lose that while overhead. I know you can't really unroll an infinite loop, but just go with me on this. Yes, it's ugly. Yes, it's kludgy. Yes, I deserve to be yelled at, but it does the job. So if we unroll this here, we can actually see where our while loop hits because we've copy pasted a bunch of cycles of up and down. And if we go ahead and zoom in on the waveform, we can see right here where that hits and measure the difference between our regular cyclical waveform and our uh, while loop overhead every time that hits. Consequently, other STM32 chips in related families have like a pin toggle function, so we don't need a loop at all. But unfortunately, we're using an F103 blue pill and not one of those. So let's try to double the frequency and see what happens. Let's, we have our little uh, two cycles up, two cycles down hold time for our square wave. Let's go ahead and unroll that loop with just one cycle up and one cycle down and see what happens. Now, if we zoom in here a little bit, we can definitely see where our while loop hits, but our waveform is utterly freaking bonkers. But we can kind of guesstimate that it's somewhere around 12 megahertz. However, since it's just sort of guessing, and I'll explain that in a little bit, right here it looks like it's 8 megahertz, over here it looks like it's 16, over here it looks like it's 9. We're getting close to the end of what we can actually do with our Logic Pro because of the sample speed. Now, I personally know that STM32 pins can toggle in two cycles. That means two up, two down is 18 megahertz. This is relevant to the next part of the story because if we take those pauses out all together and we just run pin up, pin down, unroll that loop a hundred times or whatever, and then look at it with our, um, with our logic probe, I'm going to put a 10 cycles uh, pause at the end so I can see uh, the, uh, where the unrolling stops, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, we can go ahead and zoom in on the waveform and see what it's guessing. Now, again, since this is essentially a cyclic pattern, it can guess pretty well because we're guessing at a threshold. What the problem is, is it can't get that edge. It can just kind of sort of guess what it is. So it is in fact right around 12 megahertz. We don't have the rise time to be able to see roughly where the, uh, the edge is because it's sort of in this cloud right here or rather a range of like 41 nanoseconds or so. If we take one of my uh, pre-tuned values of one megahertz and slow everything down, Here's what the edge can look like if we have much more of an idea where we are. We still don't exactly know because we don't have exactly the rise time, but we can say which much closer certainty where that rising edge is relative to our very low sampling rate, which in review is 48 mega samples per second, and that just gives us a really crappy rise time. Now, when we're talking about like digital storage oscilloscopes, they can emulate a higher sample rate for cyclical patterns, like regular repeating patterns, because they can kind of do a look ahead, average it out, take some math, and then draw fancy lines that they think is what the waveform looks like. But if you're not careful, that can also lead to not only misleading waveforms, but also aliasing and improper frequency counting. Let me explain. So let's say this is our square wave and this is where our sample rate goes. Now it's just going to say, where is that high? Where is that low? And then fill in the dots. So right here, you see, we have like high, low, low, high, and that's what it thinks the waveform is going to look like, which is obviously wrong. 
But if it has enough data points, let's say like a much bigger sample size, it can look ahead and then taking all of those various points here, sort of reconstruct through seeing more highs and more lows and detecting where more of the edges are and doing some clever math and guesswork, and then put together a kind of reasonable representation of what that signal might look like. And problem number B is that what if you have a waveform that's not cyclical and repetitive? Well, it's just going to take these samples and try to draw this high, low, 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 high, high, and you get something that looks absolutely nothing like reality. And then we get what's called aliasing, where we've actually produced some kind of not harmonically related lower integer division of our waveform. Minimum you would need is like two samples per cycle at the highest frequency of interest. Let me use the example of Nyquist frequency, which is our hard stop when you're talking about digital representation of audio data. And audio and music at its heart is just a series of complex waveforms. So our Nyquist frequency is basically half our sample rate, or twice the maximum frequency of interest. So if you have a perfect jitterless compact disc representation, the highest frequency you can represent is half of the sample rate, which is 44.1 kilohertz, meaning the highest musical frequency that you can represent is 22.05 kilohertz. Anything over that has to be filtered out. Otherwise, it guesses non-harmonically related frequencies, and that's called aliasing, just like I mentioned with our oscilloscope. So here's an audio representation of what aliasing sounds like. This is a frequency sweep from one hertz all the way up past the Nyquist frequency, and then you'll hear the harmonics here. You'll hear a fast sweep and then some at the end, and that's the aliasing. And those noises, my friends, have ruined my enjoyment of many a recording lately. So yeah, we've established that we reached our digital limits and now we're going to have to go ahead and step away from the computer and Player 3 has entered the game. Player 3 being our analog oscilloscope. This one has 100 megahertz bandwidth, which is good enough for what we're doing here. Typically, what we're talking about with speed of an oscilloscope is for analog, you want the bandwidth and for digital, you're talking about the rise time. Now, analog bandwidth is not a hard stop. If we graph our frequency versus the amplitude of our signal, right here, that's our knee, also called the minus 3 dB point, also called the upper limits of our bandwidth. So anything over that point is just going to be attenuated, and any square wave over that point is going to appear a sine wave, because that point is also what affects our rise time. So anything under this little triangle here is just going to kind of get shaved off. Consequently, that also applies to our probes. This is a 250 megahertz 10 times probe, and this is our 80 megahertz probe that came with the hand tech. Now it's only 80 megahertz in the 10 times. Once you flip it to one times, you only have a four or five megahertz probe, which again is going to start rounding off all of the edges from our square wave and reducing the amplitude. Now, before any of you grouchy engineers out there yell at me for improper probing technique, yes, I, there is going to be ringing on these signals, so just get used to it. I know technically I should have used much shorter leads, use a spring clip, something like that, but this is a just quick demo, and I literally just had the blue pill suspended in the air from the oscilloscope probes, so don't kill me. As penance, I will do a video in the future examining like 3D printing of various types of different attachments for your oscilloscope, so that'll be fun. I don't remember where I grabbed this picture from, it was somebody's blog, but I'll dig it up and give them credit when I eventually do that video. Back to work. As we said, we hit the limits of the sample rate of our digital stuff, and it also led us to believe that we had a nice regular signal, which in fact is just dirty stinking digital lies. If we poke that with our scope, we can see that this isn't anywhere near regular. That's the ringing I was talking about, sorry. Right here, you see this is our not unrolled loop, so that's gonna be in groups of twos, two by two by two, because that's the latency we have with the overhead of our while loop. So I wanted to see if I could shave any time off of the while loop, because I just don't know how this compiler reacts. And consequently also buried in your Arduino 15 folder in the platform file is your uh, compiler optimization options, which I did try, but I cut out because it was just kind of boring. First thing I tried is an infinite for loop. That didn't really change anything. Then I tried using a regular in incremented for loop with an array of figures that I was going to feed into our bit registers and that didn't speed it up. 
Then I tried using a define macro for shift up, shift down, instead of writing them each out in a loop, and that was actually slightly slower-ish. I tried making an array of all of the values and feeding it directly into the output data register, and that was actually a little bit slower, and we had a lot of overhead on our for loop when it restarted. So I tried making another array, hoping that it was aligned to memory and then unrolling it manually, and that really didn't do anything to speed it up. I tried vectorizing, I tried aligning to memory boundaries, I tried manually aligning with knops. Nothing seemed to speed it up any more than where I was, which is fine, but it was puzzling to me because I seemed to be stuck around 13 or 14 megahertz. And I knew from the data sheets that we could do 8. Well, then I had what click and clack the car talk guys call a stupiphany, which is where you have an exciting revelation about something you did that was idiotic. If you remember back to my last video, these are not genuine STM 32F103 chips. They are workalikes. However, they are not identical and you can disguise them as genuine STM chips, except for the fact that I use a ST link to upload information to the flash memory and that will recognize them as something that's not a genuine ST chip. So if you use a GD32 and say that, then you're using a workalike. If you write STM32 on top of that, then you have a counterfeit. And there are a couple very important differences with these chips. There are some good things like you have more scalers going on for your PLL, so it's easier to overclock and you have more options, but you also have problems like they have their crazy little uh, proprietary flash whatever, and God knows what that's doing. So it occurred to me that it could just be that I was working with a chip and something I was doing where I was just simply writing to that particular register was not working the same on this chip as it would on a genuine chip. So I installed the exact same code on a genuine chip, went back and forth and looked at what the differences were. Here is what the quote unquote real blue pill board looks like. And here is what the quote unquote fake blue pill board looks like. I'll toggle back and forth again, real and fake. Let me show you what those look like on top of each other. And you can see right here, yeah, something is eating two processor cycles. Although it's difficult to see with the naked eye, here's a close-up of my board. Here it is under a microscope with like a hard light shown on it. You can see that they actually ground off the GD logo and tried to stamp a fake STM logo on there. Passing it off is a real deal, which isn't terrible if you have a GD32 because in some ways they're better. But in this way, in this particular circumstance, something I was doing with just those simple operations was either causing a cycle miss or taking a couple extra cycles. So why is that important? Well, I think some of you can see where I'm going with this. A lot of these new 32-bit 3D printing motherboards from China are coming with STM32 chips on there. I hope they're not STM32 chips with quotes around them because I am doing some very basic stuff here. All I am doing is toggling a pin up and toggling it down and it threw the timing off completely and I lost like 30% of my speed. So if that's the case, there are other functions that may or may not work. I'll use another example that may or may not be true, but it is valid for the argument. And this is like pulling in this delay function Let's see one of these board makers does put a counterfeit STM32, which is actually a GD32 with a higher clock speed on it. Now, I know we explicitly set the clock speed at startup, but just walk with me here. Let's say we have a function like this that's based off the CPU frequency. Now, if we're reading or if we did read the actual frequency of the CPU and report that as FCPU for all of our functions to use, did that look at the actual physical timer or did it just have a statement that said, if STM32 F103, then the FCPU happens to equal 72 megahertz because that's what they're set at. Well, if that's the case, then the timing of every function that's based on that clock is going to be wrong if we're running it like 108 megahertz, and there's no way we would know that. Now, I trust that the main firmware is not using those issues, but what about other libraries? You know, what about something like this that's just going to be like bit banging SPI, assuming 18 megahertz because we get two up, two down. Well, I didn't get 18 megahertz because I was using a counterfeit chip. I got 18 megahertz on the real chip which means I have to add one more 
part to my thingies to test on these boards. Exploding MOSFETs, connectors ratings, switch mode power supply noise, fake microcontrollers, etc, etc, etc. That brings us to the end of our journey. I hope you learned something along the way. Make sure to visit my support links and my affiliate links in the video description below. Thank you very much for listening to all this, and we'll catch you in the next video.